This is the project so far. We've written a little HTML. We've written a little CSS. Um, let's write a couple more lines of HTML and then we'll do a little bit of JavaScript. Again, this first thing that we're creating here is just to kind of gauge for yourself how you think you'll handle the class, because this is what we'll be doing most of the time. We're going to be writing, I'll explain what's going on, we're going to be coding, but if you're having trouble keeping up with this, you know, it is going to go much faster. So let's say um, we've written this, I, I want to show an image, I want to display an image in this project. So I'll go back to my code, I've got a paragraph that I wrote some text, I want to create a new paragraph where I will display an image. So another p tag. Now we don't write p1 or p2 and such. We have h1, we have h2, h3, we have different headings to delineate size and hierarchy, yes, but not paragraphs. A p tag is a p tag, it's a paragraph. And technically a paragraph can be one line, one word, one letter, a paragraph is just some way to mark off that this content is separate from that content for the right tag, for the right task. Further, we need then the image tag. Image is IMG. An image tag is one of these that um, does not have a pair. Most other HTML tags have a pair. Start the tag here and end the tag here. Mark this as bold here and stop marking it as bold here. Or start a paragraph here and a paragraph here. But image is one of the few that does not have a pair. However, it requires an attribute. An attribute of where's my picture? So inside of the image tag space, inside of the angle bracket, we're going to add an attribute. We have a style attribute, which is about CSS. We need an attribute here for the source, S-R-C, the source of the picture. Some of these tags are spelled out. Some of them are shorthand. You just have to memorize them. Just wrote. Keep doing it over and over. You'll memorize. It's I-M-G, not I-M-A-G-E, I-M-G. Source, source attribute. The syntax of all of these attributes is the same. And syntax means how do you... How do you write the code? The syntax of the style attribute was, I wrote a property, colon, a value, semicolon. And I can add 50 CSS properties if I wanted. Uh, but, that, uh, but that syntax in general is some name of some attribute equals quotes something. Same thing here some name of some attribute equals quotes something. In this case is the source to a picture. So if I had a picture here of a cat, I would just write the file name that I'm trying to connect to. So the image tag here is complete. I'm writing a tag to display an image. I'm writing the source attribute to say which image. The problem is that then when I run it in the browser, broken link. Because this assumes that this cat picture <coughs> is in the same folder where I have my HTML code file. In my case, my HTML code, code file is on the desktop right there. And there's no picture on the desktop called cat.jpg, so this is a broken link. If I had the cat picture on my USB drive, you know, something like, uh, you know, uh, g colon uh, backslash files backslash pictures backslash cute backslash. Okay, that would be a complete path to the picture on my G drive, in the files folder, in the pictures folder, in the cute folder, cat.jpg. I don't have my flash drive plugged in or a folder called files or pictures or cute. So this will also be a broken link. But you see this is a complete path to a picture. I have a picture for you online because you can connect to a picture that's 
in the same folder as your project. You can connect to a picture that's in a different folder uh, on your computer, or you can connect to a picture that's online. Let's borrow a picture from one of my websites. In the web browser, if you go to vmcink.net, I've got a picture of a cat down at the very bottom. I'm going to borrow that picture. I'll show you how in a moment. If you go to vmcink, vmcink.net, you go to the very bottom of the screen, there's going to be a picture. Depending on your web browser, I'm in Firefox, you can click, you can right click the picture and I think it'll say copy link location or copy location or copy address. Mine's a little slow because you're all crashing my site. But as soon as mine loads up, I'll show you. You want to right click, copy image location. That will give you the link to the picture on my website. Now mine is kind of slow, so maybe I can grab the picture on the college's website or something. But I could save the picture in the same folder as my project, but then I have to write the file name exactly. This should also work. Chrome might call it copy URL or something, but in Firefox it's saying copy image location. That's the address to the picture. So my site's not loading up. I'll just borrow the colleges. Yes, if it's not loading up, you can come back to the college's website and copy the college's picture. Oh, there it is eventually. So if you do, if the site does load up, you can get, you know, coding cat over here. If my site never loads up, don't worry, you can do it back on the college's website here. Just borrow that picture, it doesn't matter. Right click, copy image, location. Right click, copy image, location. And that's the address, that huge address right there. So this is a link to a server online in another folder, in another folder, vmccatprogrammer.jpg. So any picture that's online, usually you can right click it and you might see copy image location. So that's what you're going to copy and put into the um, source attribute. And so the result is the picture. Now CSS works to change the style of a background color or a text color, but CSS also is used to resize things or position things on screen. So I'm going to add another style attribute to image to change the default size of the picture. In HTML and CSS, it matters the order in which you write your code, but it matters even more in JavaScript. At the moment, it doesn't quite matter, but I wrote the image tag, source attribute, I'm going to add the style attribute next. I could add it before source, after. At this point, it doesn't matter, and I'll tell you when it matters, but I want to add now a style attribute to the image tag, I'll add it after source. So at the, at the end of your code there, after the quote, style equals quotes. So I have image, source equals quotes, and inside the quote, a huge address. And style equals quotes. 
you can set a width colon let's say 100 px so width colon space 100 pixels no space there uh, some of you may have not been writing the space there that's fine actually with colon no space you know property value in between maybe you didn't write a space that, that's fine sometimes this stuff is very forgiving but on javascript we'll see it is there's very little forgiveness here if you had the space or not it should have worked the problem is if you put a hundred space px that would cause a problem so I'll point out the parts where you know your syntax has to be very specific. Uh, I'm here saying let's change the width of this image to be 100 pixels, 100 dots, and the units is pixels, so there's no space in between the number and the unit. Semicolon space height colon space. Let's say 200 px pixels. In this case, again, if I had no space after the semicolon, and I had no space after the colon, that would actually be fine. It would still process it fine, but now that's getting a little harder to read. The words are running together. So I added a space after the semicolon and a space after the colon. So if you run it in your browser, the picture is resized. Kind of in a weird way. Looks like it's stretched out. So that's simply uh, playing with these values. CSS can be used to affect colors and fonts and alignments and sizes and even other graphic elements. We can add a drop shadow to this picture. The original picture didn't have a drop shadow. Now, how, how many of you uh, have any experience in Photoshop? Adobe Photoshop, a few people. So using Photoshop, you can create graphical effects like drop shadows so that it looks like the picture is popping off the page. In the old days, that's what we needed to do. I would open that photo in Photoshop, I would add a drop shadow, put it on my site. And then I decide I don't like how it looks, so I have to take it back to Photoshop, change the filter, the effect, or then save it again and you know do this process over and over. Uh, more modern versions of the CSS code let us create some of these graphical elements simply with a little code without having to edit the original file. So here we're going to add We've got a width property, a height property, semicolon. Let's add a new property called box-shadow, colon. This is the name of the property of CSS to create a drop shadow. It would have been nice if they called it drop shadow. But no one had that great idea. They called it box-shadow, box-shadow. This one is more complex in that it has more than one value. Width property has one value, you know, the, the width, some amount of units. The background color property had one value, yellow, or, you know, the formula. But the box shadow has several properties. For the moment, just go ahead and write this, and then we'll, and then I'll explain what it is. 5px space 5px space 5px space black, semicolon. Spaces do matter here. A colon space, something space, something space, something space, something. Just write that for the moment, save it and run it. 
and now I'll explain what this did. But this is the box shadow. This is the drop shadow CSS property. So with property semicolon, height property semicolon, drop shadow property semicolon. What that should do is a drop shadow when you save it. And there it is. Remember to save. Remember to save your code before you run it or refresh it. Okay, so if I if I weren't if I didn't explain to you, as I'm going to, what these values do, how might you figure out what they do? Looks like one for depth. No, how might you figure out how, what it is? Google, Bing, Yahoo. Yeah, you can look it up online. Great. What if I don't want to go online? Test it by changing the values. So these are offset values. I put it on 15, and now the shadow moved 15 pixels to the right. When it was at 5, it was only moved over a little bit, 5 pixels. That's the first value. OK, again, playing around with this. What if I put 25 on the next one and move the shadow down more pixels? And the third one, let's say I bring it down to one, one pixel. It's not so blurry. What I'm getting at is, if I don't tell you something, you should look it up. You should check the book. You should experiment. Change these values. What if I do this? What if I do that? If you make a mistake, there's undo, right? We've got edit undo, or we've got the undo button right there. So don't be afraid to try something, to make changes, to break it, to undo it, and try it again. Because you'll go further when you do go beyond. If you just do exactly what I do, you'll get some good knowledge, but you should always try to be going outside the box also. So technically what we're doing here is the first value is the x offset. It moves the uh, shadow to the right. The second one is the y offset. It moves it down. The third one is a blur value. And then the fourth one is color. Because we can define any colors we want here. Right? Keep coming back to pink just because it's so easy to type. Pink. Also type red often. You, know, you can type red with one hand if you can type. So um, you have various values. Now what if I wanted to move the shadow to the left? Negative values. So negative 5, move it to the left. I wanted to move it up, which is counterintuitive, negative. You would think because it goes up, it's positive values, but this is negative values to move it up because technically it's starting from the top left corner of the image. On the top left corner of the image, right there, positive values go to the right, positive values go down. So negative values will go to the left and negative values will go up. And don't put a negative value for the third one, because I think smoke will start coming out of your computer. <laughs> or maybe nothing will happen. Either or, it's bad. So um, this third one is a blurriness value, blur value. And on that one, you can go overboard really quickly. You know, Once you're getting it to like over 10, it blurs it way too much. You put it on zero blur, but I guess... It's almost the same as one. And the cool thing about then the color is you can put a 
you know you can put a any any color here, but you can also put a color formula, RGB. 125, 0. And here's something new. We have a way also to create transparent colors. RGB is saying 100 units of red, 25 of green, 0 of blue. Well, Let's say I, uh, I have 25, 225. This is a solid color of green, RGB. We can create also transparent colors if we mix a, an RGBA formula, A for alpha, which is the fancy way of saying transparency. So now I have a fourth value here some red value, green value, blue value, alpha value. And that is a percentage from 0 to 1. So comma, 0 0.5, 50%. So that's going to be some green color, 50% visible from 0 to 1. If I wanted 3 quarters of the way visible, 0 0.75. If I only wanted 10% visible, 0 0.10. So it's not so impressive here, but let's say there was a background picture. That color would be 50% transparent to see the picture behind it. So this box shadow is a uh, is a relatively modern CSS property. It's technically a CSS3 property, third generation. So with box shadow, we make a box shadow. We could do some fun things here. Uh, what's between positive and negative? Okay. Zero. If we put zero here, which you don't need the units, You can, um, just to make it obvious, you can do this interesting glow effect. It's not moving off to the right or the left or up or down. It's at zero. You don't put pixels because it's just a zero unit. It's in the middle. It's nothing. Then I put a blur and I put a color. I can put transparency, but I just pick red to be visible. And I have a glow type of effect around the image. That, to do that, traditionally, was Photoshop. And then I don't like how it looks, I go back to Photoshop, I change it, I tweak it, I put it back on the web, I don't like it, go back. Here I just change it with a few, few keystrokes. More blur, different color, different effect. And then when we deal with animation, we can then have it fading in and fading out and all of that stuff. So all of this uh, was the image tag. It had a source attribute, where's the picture? It had a style attribute, how do we redefine its default properties via CSS? Remember earlier, the picture was bigger. It was much bigger. That's before any style changes. And now, now with some style, it's smaller and you know, drop shadow and all of that. Let's say then I want to add a link so that it goes back to the website where this came from, vmcinc.net. I want to add a link. Well, within the same paragraph, I want to sort of group together the image and the text, which is a link back to, you know, we'll say visit the website. And we want that to go back to the website in the same paragraph. So like I did previously over here with this other paragraph, we want to break the line. We want the image on one line, break the text on another line within the same paragraph. So at the end of image, 
after that angle bracket for image, we can add a break tag. Technically, we could add that break tag on the next line. You could add that break before or after. It doesn't really matter. It'll be processed the same way from top to bottom. The browser will get to this point, display a paragraph, this point, display an image, this point, break the line. It doesn't matter if it's here or up there. If you put one above and one below, you'll have two spaces. No big deal. But um, just put it wherever. And what we're going to have written here is, say, visit VMC Inc. That's the name of the website. We want that to be a link to go back to the website. HTML, hypertext markup language. It's a programming language where you're marking stuff. I've marked where the paragraph is, where the image is. And the HT part of it is hypertext, which is the fancy way of saying links. So it's a language for marking links. That was revolutionary. Again, it's not hyperbole. That changed the world. There wasn't anything quite like it before. And a student in Europe invented it, put it out to the world for free, and changed the world. A way to link one document to another. And now it's so obvious 25 years later. But this was revolutionary. Is anyone watching that show on AMC? No, the other show. Um, uh, halt and Catch Fire. It's a really good show about the birth of the computer industry. And now on season four, I think, it's getting into the birth of the internet, the web. It's a really fascinating look at a history that we all possibly lived through, but as a dramatic interpretation. So it's really fun for me because I'm seeing there. I remember that in the 90s. I remember visiting my first website. I remember Yahoo.com and all that old stuff. And I remember writing my first website, and they're kind of dramatizing it. It's called Halt and Catch Fire. It's a pretty good show. So uh, there's a plot in there that, you know, the daughter of uh, one of the characters is making her first website, and the father is so thunderstruck by it, like, anyone can do this, anyone can make a website. And 25 years ago, it was revolutionary, and still is. The world has changed because of HTML, because of the simple things like this. A tag. This is going to create a link. You may think, well, I can write link. But no, actually, the link tag to link this someplace else is an A tag, A for anchor. So I'm marking this will be a link. Think about it as an active link, if you want. Link this to the website. Well, it doesn't know which website because it's missing an attribute. So back to the A tag there, href, hypertext reference. Image tag with a source attribute. What's the source of my picture? A tag for an active link with an href attribute to reference the hypertext, the address, http colon slash slash vmcinc.net. Don't forget the closing A tag. This one does have a pair. We need to say where does the link start and where does it end. I made that whole line a link. Yes? Question. How do you want the image? You have to have the www before the website name and on the website. When I copied it off of the website, that's what it gave me. Uh, here, nowadays, most of the time, it doesn't matter if you have the WW or not, so it should work. Um, just wanted to save some effort and not type it. But so that technically, would work. you wouldn't need it on the image then either. Exactly. Uh, WW nowadays is almost assumed, so we don't really quite need it, but that's just what copy and paste it. So that is linking the whole line. You could have also uh, set it so that only uh, the A tag only wraps around VMC Inc. 
that word is not linked, it will look normal. Then the A tag starts and wraps around the MC and ends. Just a little copy and paste there. You don't have to do it. I'll put it back. I'm just showing you that HTML is markup language. Uh, that we mark something and then the browser processes it, interprets it. It doesn't compile it. It's not a compiled language. It's a runtime language. The result then is a new line below it, visit VMC Inc. And if you click on it, it goes back to the website. If you've never had any experience in HTML, we've covered a lot of the basic basic concepts here. Tags, the importance of opening and closing tags, the tags here and there that don't have a pair that you just have to memorize, image tag, break tag, other ones that are in the book. We played a little bit with CSS in that it could be simply for graphics, or colors, or also resizing and special effects. There's a lot of other ones, like for alignment and making columns, and even animation. So those are the two pillars of modern web design and app design, HTML and CSS. We're going to touch a little bit on JavaScript in a moment, but any questions so far before we go to, before we go to JavaScript? Does it work for everyone? Anyone need a little help? Does it look something like this? So you might have noticed that as I'm writing, I might write it quickly. How many of you have ever taken a uh, typing class before? No one? Do, don't they teach it at high school anymore? <laughs> I would highly recommend you take a typing class because especially if you're going to code a lot, it does really help for you to know where the layout is. You might be able to teach yourself but I know that it really helped me to take a typing class to memorize the keyboard. Um, I took a typing class in high school in the 90s when it was a real typewriter, although it was electric. Uh, but nowadays you can get like free online typing tutorials on websites. I highly recommend you learn that because I remember one time someone asked me, are you really typing all of that? Like I was playing back a video or something because I was simply typing it so fast, because yeah, I know the keyboard layout. And also keyboard shortcuts, you know, copying and pasting, running it, and all of that. Like, I'm not touching the mouse and I'm running the, I'm running the, the, the browser. Keyboard shortcuts, think about memorizing those, especially save. All these keyboard shortcuts are listed on the right side of the menus. It doesn't take that long to go to run, launch Firefox, half a second. But those half seconds add up as you do it over and over, as you program. There is a keyboard shortcut. Run, launch Firefox, is also Control-Alt-Shift-X. <coughs> and you might be used to, you know, Control-S. This is Control-Alt-Shift-X for Firefox. And you can master it with one hand. It's right there on the bottom left corner of the keyboard, actually, right? Thumb, pinky, ring finger, pointing finger. You can do it all with one hand if you practice. Uh, these keyboard shortcuts are going to be so useful to save you time and effort. Uh, Chrome. You want to do Chrome, it's Control alt shift r Just move your index finger, your pointing finger, over to the R. And a lot of these other things also have keyboard shortcuts. So learn some typing, learn keyboard shortcuts, that'll really help you as a programmer. One more thing, then we'll do JavaScript. What also helps you as a programmer is your code editor. We came here to Notepad++, and it's one of many code editors. And this code editor gives you this color coding. Have you noticed this, this line on the edge over here? And these lines over here, too. A, a good text, a good code editor will give you this, these hints and this help when you're typing. For example, if you click once, on your body tag, it should highlight the pair. If it doesn't highlight the pair like mine, that means something is wrong. 
right? I type, I click body, it didn't highlight the pair. Oh, I mistyped body. That's one way of debugging, of troubleshooting your, your errors. If it doesn't find your pair of tags and there should have been a pair, that's a possible thing to fix. You know, image doesn't have a pair, so you don't really see anything. But P has a pair, HTML has a pair. And notice how the red line appears and it goes from beginning to end. If I misspelled something early on, and I check the browser, all my code is completely gone, nothing is here. Well, I would try to start troubleshooting this, and we'll have a more in-depth troubleshooting. I would start to troubleshoot by clicking the tags, do I see the pair? There's the pair, 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 I don't see my error, I don't know what's going on. Oh, that didn't find its pair. And it's also a different color. The tags are blue, but this one is black. So it didn't find the pair of title, title never ended, and then what happened is it put everything up on the tab. Look at that, it put everything in the tab, not the body. So the markup language, it didn't mark where it ended. And it helped me, and Notepad++ helped me figure that out simply by the color coding or following, you know, the path of the connection. If you click these minus signs, this is for code collapsing also. Let's say I don't want to look at what's in the head for a while. You can collapse it. Sometimes that might be helpful. But definitely what's helpful for a lot of beginners or even intermediate and advanced people is check if your pairs of codes of tags are there. Notice how the color changes when I'm in style. When I'm outside of style, it's blue and red and purple. But when I click on style, it becomes yellow. If that's a different color, you know, I see yellow, but I don't see the red. That almost looks correct. And then I see my code, and um, why isn't it yellow? I typed it all right, just like the instructor. Nope, that's misspelled. So color coding. It's a basic thing that really helps. Um, this color scheme is the default of Notepad++, but there are other color schemes that also help you long-term in coding. Right now, looking at this color scheme, it's not one of the best ones because uh, you know I'm looking at the monitor and the monitor is blasting me with white light. And if I'm in a dark room or if I'm coding for a long time, I've got this bright light pointing right at my face while I'm coding. We have a way to change the color scheme, the theme, to uh, other colors that are a little easier on the eyes. Go up to Settings menu. We can go to Style Configurator, which I don't think is a real word. Let's go to Style Configurator. Settings menu, Style Configurator. The theme is default. If I put it on Bespin, for example, I get that color theme. If I put it on Khaki, there's that theme. Now you might say this is superfluous. You know, the default is perfectly fine. Ruby blue. It is superfluous to some degree, but choosing one of the darker color themes actually is better for you coding long term. Because you know, how many of you, at the end of the day, you go to bed and you're still looking at your phone, you probably turn down the, turn down the brightness. You don't want that bright light blasting you when you're, when you're in bed. So this is similar to that. Choosing one of these darker themes is not going to have bright light blasting you in the face. I like to use Bespin, and I also like Blackboard. The colors are totally different <coughs> right now. Now comments are gray, and regular tags are orange. I'm always going to keep it on default, and that's what you'll always see when you come in the lab. But if you change it to any other color, obsidian, I think that one's too low contrast, you can go to these other colors which are a little bit easier on your eyes. But I do have to say, if you're a real programmer, you have to choose Hello Kitty. <laughs> I'm going to keep it on default, but any other color that you like is fine, and then you can save. 
every time you come in, you'll need to set that again because these computers have Deep Freeze, which is an app that automatically erases everything you did back to our factory settings. So this that we're writing today, if you leave it on the desktop, it will not be here next time. Deep Freeze will erase it. I don't go in and erase it. Deep Freeze, the software does it. Anything that you change on our computers will get reset. If you change the background color here on Windows to your cat's picture, it'll reset back to factory settings blue. So what's bad about that is if you save this on your desktop and you don't take it with you, it won't be here. The good thing about it is it's a public lab. If you forgot to log, to log out of your Gmail, when the computer restarts, it erases your login. You're not logged in anymore. If this computer gets, if your computer gets a virus, we restart the computer and it resets it back to factory settings. So this is a public lab. Deep freeze here is going to destroy uh, what you've done. It'll go back to default. So remember to save your work. Take the work with you, that is. And you'll need to set your style every time you come in. Let's wrap up uh, today's quick intro to our languages with a little bit of JavaScript. So HTML, easy. CSS, medium. Uh, JavaScript, hard. But we'll talk about it a little bit here. To make it the most easiest, um, after your paragraph here, we're going to create a new tag called script. If you have any experience in websites and stuff before, you'll know that there's inline JavaScript, embedded JavaScript, external JavaScript. Don't worry about it at the moment. We're going to write JavaScript. We've written HTML, we've written CSS style. Now in here we're going to write JavaScript. Script by default means JavaScript. Comment. What follows is JavaScript code. It uses a different comment tag. <clears throat> so anywhere we wrote comments over here with this syntax, angle bracket exclamation point, that's an HTML comment. That is not valid in JavaScript land. In the script block. We have a different tag. Two different tags, actually. This is a single line JavaScript comment. Two slashes with no space in between them is a comma, is a comment. If I have a space, the code goes back to black thinking it's a valid JavaScript code. No space between those slashes, forward slashes, space here, sure, and then everything that follows is a single line comment, meaning that if on the next line I am continuing my comment, nope, the double slash starts and ends automatically at the end of the line wherever it is. You don't need to write any sort of ending slash or whatever. Not necessary. It's a single line. Whatever is there is commented out. So if I wanted to continue that other line, I need another double slash. We also have slash asterisk. Everything suddenly turned green. A couple of enters, asterisk slash. Went back to normal is a multi-line JavaScript comment. Like we had this one. This one does both. Single line, when you close it, multi-line, starting and closing somewhere. Slash asterisk, asterisk slash. It has to be in that order. If it's slash asterisk, technically you started another comment. Not correct. This is a multi-line JavaScript comment continues as long as you need it.
So JavaScript is uh, very powerful, very cool, and uh, could be difficult. Um, JavaScript is the third pillar of modern web design, of app design. HTML is for uh, structure and content. CSS is for design. JavaScript is for interactivity. It's for interactivity, for something to happen. I'm going to create a button that when I click it, something happens. I want a result from my action. That's where JavaScript comes in. Something to trigger something. Uh, we'll do that in one moment. Let's first do this. Next line. Let's write console dot log parentheses open close parentheses semicolon. This is a JavaScript command. The syntax looks very different than HTML. HTML had tags that opened and closed. Here we're dealing with objects. JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. For the moment you don't have to worry about what that is, but basically we've got an object and we're invoking a method. You don't have to quite worry about what that is yet. We're running a JavaScript command. Inside of the parentheses, in quotes, I want to say, look at my JavaScript. So this command seems to say something, the words, look at my JavaScript, it seems to show it or display it somewhere. This is a JavaScript command to output a message. Save it and run it in the browser, and let's see that message. The spelling in JavaScript completely matters. In HTML, technically, we could have had a capital P, lowercase p, it would have worked fine. But we've been writing everything in lowercase. We could have been really creative and written capital I, lowercase m, capital G. That would have worked fine. Uh, HTML is very forgiving. That would work fine. Uh, H, uh, CSS and JavaScript, and especially JavaScript, are not forgiving. If you type capital C, this will not work. If you type capital L, this will not work. Lowercase, unless it's uppercase, which we'll see when. But this is all lowercase. Console.log. If I check the browser, I don't see that message anywhere. Because I am targeting the console object. This is not the console object. This is the document object. JavaScript is object-oriented. It lets you manipulate objects. So to see this message, we have to look at the console. In most web browsers, you can press F12 on the keyboard to pull up the developer's console. Um, I press F12 in Firefox. I get a panel down here that says console. If you're in Chrome, it may look a little different. In Chrome, it'll look like this. F12 might appear on the right side. You might see Elements, and you might see Console. So every browser is a little bit different, but F12 is the developer's console. In Firefox, look at my JavaScript. It says here that in your current file, line 36, you output that. I also get a big scary looking message. Don't worry about it at the moment. Chrome uh, Chrome didn't give me that error message, but it did give me my output. It did again tell me line 36. Firefox tells you line 36, column 4. That second value is a column. So there's column. You can also see that in Notepad down here. Line 36, column 4 whatever. Column 4. So the console object, we invoked the log method, and we output look at my JavaScript. So this is look at my JavaScript in the console. Next 
next line. Document dot write. In the document object, use the write method. So it's document dot write. Parentheses. Let's write something in the document object. Let's log something in the console object. Now, I looked at my JavaScript. Save it and run it. This text should now appear in the main area of the web browser, the document. If I refresh it, or run it again, you should see text that appears in the main browser. So I'm writing all of this code between the script tags. And I wrote some code that appeared somewhere in the browser and somewhere else. We'll get into details, of course, what is object-oriented, and all of that. Yes? This is very valuable to write to the console when we're, when we're beta testing it, when we're trying to figure out the algorithm, when we're trying to check why is it not working. So this is to give ourselves messages as a developer. The regular person will never see this, although you can see the console on any website. And there might be hidden secret stuff there that no one ever sees. <laughs> But for us, we're going to use this a lot. We're going to output messages to ourselves to troubleshoot and debug our code. This is one way to write something to the main visible area of the web browser, document.write. Um, I always forget this one. It's either document or window. Let's try document. Document.alert. Anyone have uh, JavaScript off the top of their head? Is it document or window? Window. window. Okay. I'm trusting you. <laughs> Window.alert. This is a different object. We're going to write or output an alert. Hello world. I always forget because technically on this one you don't have to write the object, you can just write the method. But let's be complete for the moment. Window.alert. To the window object, we're going to use the alert method. A method is another word. You can sort of think about it as command. This is the actual alert command, the write command, the log command. Technically, methods. You've got these objects. Console object, document object, window object. So if you run that, right away, a pop-up. This page says, hello world. When you refresh it, you get a pop-up. Hello world. Chrome looks like this. Firefox looks like that. But they're both a pop-up. Hello world window.alert <clears throat> We'll be able to place the pop-up wherever we want and style it and do all of that stuff, but here's something very simple. So we can go back and write some comments here. JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. You use or create objects. That's right, I guess you use or create methods on objects. Built in or user defined. There is the console object that is built in. Every web browser or mobile device 
has that object or the document object or the window object. There's other objects like history. We can tap into the history, the person's history, as they browse. And then we have these methods. These methods are then actual actions or commands. Make a pop up on, on that window. This shows again that all of this code, especially JavaScript, is processed from top to bottom, beginning to end. So when the web browser got to this line of code, it processed that, then this, then that. It does matter the order, because if we were to have put this JavaScript code first at the top, it would have written hello world first at the top, and then the other stuff, or not at all, depending on various things. So the order of this code does matter. Now, this happened all by itself. I want a trigger. I want a button that I press for the pop-up to happen. So, for the moment, I'm going to deactivate that window.alert. Deactivating the code is simply commenting it out. This is valuable to do. Instead of deleting that code, you can comment it out, and then it shuts off. If I run it, I get no more pop-up because it's been deactivated doesn't pop up anymore. So for the moment, deactivate that alert. I don't want alert to happen until someone presses a button. JavaScript is very cool and powerful because it can write, it can be used for JavaScript, and it can also write, create, manipulate HTML code. It can also write, create, and manipulate CSS code. So JavaScript can do it all. It can focus on just JavaScript or affect and control HTML and CSS. To make it super simple, however, we'll go back to the main body area and we'll write, we'll create a button in plain old HTML. We could create a button with JavaScript, but it's more trouble than it's worth at the moment. So we'll back up. Uh, let's say let's say we'll break. I'm in the same paragraph, break, so it's on a new line. I'm going to create a button. We have a tag called button. It has a pair. We could break that into multiple lines, doesn't matter. I'll keep it on one line. Button, we'll just have it say click it. The words click it will appear on the button. Start the button, end the button, in between text. <coughs> We've got the link, it's a little too close, don't worry. Button, JavaScript, right, it goes in order. Got a button. I want to be able to click on this button for the pop-up to happen. Right now it doesn't do anything. It doesn't know that this button needs to be clicked on to make the pop-up. Now we're going to do this, just to show you, we're going to do this the hard way. Because, again, JavaScript is, is complex. But once you get the rhythm of it and the syntax, it makes perfect sense. So, let's say after window We're, we need to refer to that object button. We refer to the console object, the document object, the window object. I want to refer to that button. So I can create some code to refer to that button, but I may have more than one button. So what a good practice here, a good way to do this is, if we uniquely identify this button, we can target that button with JavaScript. Let's back up to that button, and let's give it an attribute of ID, this identifier, which if you know some CSS, it also applies in CSS. But this ID, this identifier, we can uniquely identify this. We're going to make up a name for this button so we can reference it in JavaScript. BTN, click. Since we're making the name up, we can call it however we want. I, exactly. It could be called Kitty. 
and it will work. It could be called Kitty, and it will work. Capitalization does matter. And these names could be anything we want. But when we get into more of the JavaScript hardcore, um, we're going to go and uh, adhere to various sorts of styles of JavaScript programming. One of the styles is that we create a prefix on the particular ID, and then its name followed by a capital letter. This would be exactly the same if it was BTN lowercase c. But if I use a lowercase c there, I better use a lowercase in the JavaScript. And if I use an uppercase in the HTML, I better use an uppercase in the, in the JavaScript. So this has a unique identifier, btn click. We need to create a reference to that object now. var variable object. We're going to create an object. Console object is built in, document is built in. We're going to create our own object, var. We'll call it el. That's an l, not a 1. btn click. Yes, I changed the letter B there, because we can make these up. EL for elements. BTN click, capital C, sorry. But this is, again, that style of JavaScript. The first letter is not capitalized, and the following letters are capitalized. Because we have to run the word together for it to be readable, this style of JavaScript puts capital letters in the, in the name. LBTN click like that will work, but it's getting a little hard to, for me to read as a person. The computer won't care. It'll process it. But this style of JavaScript is that we put capital letters to differentiate the words. Now that's a lot more readable. This style also doesn't put a capital letter on the first one. You could, and it'll work, but you have to be consistent. EL for element. Object. We're creating an object here. Element BTN click. Space equals. Console is defined in the deep dark recesses of the JavaScript language. We just then use it. We have to define what does L button click mean? So equals to assign a meaning to it. Document dot get element by ID parenthesis semicolon. So here we're saying, go look in the main document. And we already saw that document is the stuff up there. Go look in the main document object and use the method, the command, get element by ID. The button is an element. It has an ID. So in the parentheses, in quotes, btn click. All of this is to create a shorthand. All of this basically is put into a shortcut, l button click. So now I can start to refer to that simply as l button click. But they refer to console.log. So all of that, go to the document, get an element by its ID, which ID, the one that I wrote here, <clears throat> and notice in Notepad, when you select something, it'll select other instances of that throughout your code. So if I misspelled click, and I select it there, it won't select up there. If I typed it right, and then select it, it'll select it in different, in different areas. Next, next line. OK, I've created my own object. Now we can reference it. L, btn, click, dot, on. I'm sorry, add, event, listener. Again, we're doing it the hard way. So some object, some method, some command on some object, some command on some object, a method on an object, a variable. 
Notice the spelling again. Capital, you know, th this is an example, and this is an example of JavaScript that's built in, so it has to be typed exactly the way I wrote it. Get, lowercase g, capital E element, capital B by, capital I, ID, but not a capital D, and this is a beginner mistake that everyone does. It's not capital I, capital D. That will not work. It's capital I, lowercase d. Add event listener. Capital E, capital L. So what we're saying here is now, listen for an event on that object. Wait for a click to happen on that button. That's what that is saying in JavaScript. You know, as the person, all I have to say is, you know, click the button, wait for the button to be clicked. But I have to think in terms of the way the language was invented and the syntax and the way they wanted us to write the code. And the way when this was invented in 1994, I think, this is, this is how it was. We want to uh, have an event that we're listening for. In the parentheses and quotes, the event is a click. Wait for a click. Wait for the event of a click. Listen for an event of a click upon this object. This is the shorthand for ultimately that button with that ID. Comma, because this built-in JavaScript method has to Two, two arguments, two, two parameters. Um, what's the event we're waiting for, comma, what's the, what's the result of that event happening? Um, possible events are a click, a double click, a drag, you know, zoom in, zoom out. There's a bunch of events that could happen, and we want a result to happen after, after that. Um, we're going to then say here, fn message. Let's display a message, a function. Let's display a message after there's a click while we're waiting on the button. And um, we need to define what does fn message mean. This is one that we're making up. This one's not built in. Again, this is just a quick introduction for today. We're going to go into a lot of detail more later. Just uh, for the moment, this is how we're setting ourselves up. We need to define what is fn message. And um, I did say our code, we're going to write it step by step. It's process top to bottom. We should define this function before the event listener. We're saying, we've got an object, we're going to do something with it. The something is a click. After the click, do some more steps. So we have to define what those steps are before we try to use those steps. So I'm backing up one line before. We'll say function fn message, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. I, I haven't. I forgot to say. At, at the end of all of these JavaScript commands, do you see we're seeing a semicolon? In JavaScript, here it definitely is much more about end of statement than CSS. Console.log semicolon end of statement. Var l button click end of statement. We are completing the command. It's very important in JavaScript that semicolon. One quirk is that we don't really need a semicolon here. It will work fine if we add a semicolon there, but actually some error checkers will tell you that's an error. So I follow the style where there's no semicolon when you define a function. Inside of those parentheses, finally, or curly braces, is where I want this window.alert. I want the, I want that pop-up to happen on the event of a click. So either copy and paste or cut it and paste it 
and this window.alert, put it between those curly braces. I'm going to cut it and then paste it. We're going to see that there's many ways to write JavaScript, many styles. They're all right, they're all wrong. It just depends what you're trying to do, and that it does what you want, and that it's efficient or elegant, or etc. If you know other ways to do this, great, you, you can do it. But if you've never done JavaScript before, this is one way. This is no longer a comment, so you can delete that if you want. So this is a this is kind of a lot of work to just to make a button do a pop-up. Yes, ver, uh, JavaScript can be very verbose. You have to write a lot of code to accomplish something simple. With basic JavaScript. We create an object that represents the button. We create an event listener to wait for a click. Once it's clicked, run a series of steps, which is a function. There's only one step. Alert, hello. So this could have 50 steps. Make a pop-up, play a sound, spin a picture. And all of those steps are defined in a function. So now if we run it, You should not get the pop-up automatically until you click it. Now the world. If it didn't work, you want to open your developer's console, F12. If it didn't work, this is another reason why the console is there. Not just to give yourself messages, but you, you would get perhaps errors. This one about character encoding, just ignore that one. But Type error. L button, event listener is not a function. Huh, learn more and such. So this developer's console is also a way to help you figure out your errors because it's going to tell you, go check line 47 in my case. And I see, oh, I misspelled listener. So I spelled that right. Now what if I created L button click, but I wrote L button click? Capitalization does matter. Reference error. L button click is not defined. Of course it is. I typed it. No, I typed capital letters, not lowercase. So check your console if it didn't quite work. That's our first, or, or raise your hand, but that's our first touch of JavaScript. It's very verbose, it's very wordy. Had to do a lot of setup here. You may know other ways to do it, and that's fine, it's valid. You may know jQuery methods. We'll talk about jQuery later. But this is our first introduction to HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We're going to write much more of this as time goes on. I didn't write any comments. I'll write comments next time we do this for real. But this is how we're going to do the class. We're going to write, we're going to explain, explore, we're going to run it. Eventually, this will go on a real device. We will work with databases. We'll be able to write JavaScript to activate the camera of your device to take photos. We'll be able to write JavaScript to activate Bluetooth to connect to another device. We'll be able to write code to access the contacts of the device to send a text message. So all of that app stuff we're going to get to it via HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But part one of the class is focused on a web project. Part two, we're going to take that web project, upgrade it to a mobile project with Visual Studio. And then part three, we're going to add advanced features and publish it. So together, we're going to create the CBDB project, the comic book database, on the side Optionally, you could work on your own project as we learn these concepts. You'll work on it, you'll be graded on the CBDB project. Once you put in your 84 hours, you do all the homework, you do the attendance, you get the certificate, and you'll get a real app on a real app store. That's this class. General questions? Yes? Let me let me answer your question in a moment. Let's talk about general questions. General questions of the class. Okay, so the way that we'll do this, I'll type the code. I'm going to put it in the network folder if you want a copy of it, and then we'll do lab time. 
Usually by 9 o'clock we do lab time if you need one-on-one -on -one help. Today we ran a little far because we're having so much fun. But I'm going to put my code in the folder. Call me over if you need some help. And we'll keep going.